Hello there, welcome to TAP. How are you feeling? How are you breathing? Ah, I will allow myself in the spirit of this episode to breathe even more deeply throughout. <laughs> And I'll, I'll try not to do it directly into the microphone, that's not charming. <laughs> but, uh, but so this is, this is going to be a really great chapter. So I'm happy you're here, you should be happy as well. <laughs> I'm happy for you if you're not. Okay, so I have this theme about the real self. I mentioned it in, I think it was the last solo, that I would do several parts of that. But, 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 the real self, it's its a lifelong theme. It's like, uh, how can I, how can I actually care about something that's not about this theme? In a way, it all is. So I will take my time with it. And because I did start to say, okay, now I've done this one with the real self. Now what, what author should I focus on? And that strategy didn't lead me anywhere. <laughs> I was like, mm, not this, not this. So I just decided to go with that author that I was reading anyway. And it, when it comes down to it, I think it's very related. Because I have had this very clear revelation over the last couple of years that tension, physical tension is in fact related to everything we are not so on a personal level and I do feel that this is one of those days where I can digress a little bit so I'll try to keep it short <laughs> but just on a personal level especially my father was an extreme case of an unregulated nervous system he was angry in I think maybe all of our interactions, or at least 99% of them. And and not only anger, also, yeah, this nervousness, like when driving or anything. And and as a young person, of course, I, I also knew, okay, I, I get upset easily. What is going on with this? And also I knew that there was a lot of things that I did not dare to do. So I'm not saying it's all co connected to my father, but I am trying to make a point uh, about how we've internalized other people's nervous system, uh, if that's the right word. That's why I'm laughing. I'm like, is that the right word? But uh, yeah, because there's this transmission, right, of, of th this neuro... Um, transmission so so what we grew up in has become some maybe a side to us and maybe just habitual patterns inside of us so I was saying that I kind of knew all of this and I you know I went into teaching yoga and yet only within the last couple of years have I really discovered what this tension is about. I mean, I don't think, I'm not sure it's it's like the full version that I have yet, but it's it's part of it. It's part of it. So so there's it's really a vicious cycle when you have children and you have this unregulated nervous system. You've sort of inherited and you haven't found a way to release yourself from what you internalized from what you adapted to because it's also an, an, an environmental adaptation surely uh, because it would be I would explode you know like my father had done but less it, it was less surely <laughs> I must say that it was less but still it was uncontrollable for me the way that I exploded the way that I had a hot temper with my kids and then you come out of it or I came out of it and then this cycle of going into feelings of guilt because this is the this is the worst this is what you do not want to have happen and yet it happened so the reason why I'm underscoring this the so it could be a pattern of being triggered I'm sure it can show up in, in different ways is that this tension that I'm talking about is unconscious. 
it's unconscious. So yeah, sort of knowing maybe it's there. Also, like knowing, oh, this is, you know, I'm this type of person who don't dare to this, do this, and I also get, you know, I get scared often. So you can kind of be aware of those things. But there's something at a at a deeper level, uh, you know, something is really going on there, underneath, underneath, underneath. So, so this tension is, I think, it's in a way that is the gate to the real self because it's underneath the tension. It's in the resolving of the tension. Okay, so this solo episode is going to be about Herbert Benson, who unfortunately died just last year. He was an American doctor. And I found this quote online saying he's a pioneer in mind-body medicine and one of the first Western physicians to bring spirituality into healing no, spirituality and healing into medicine. Yeah. And we're going to go through the book today called Beyond the Relaxation Response. And his first book, I'm not sure, I don't think it's his, probably not his first publication, but the, his first bestseller book is called The Relaxation uh, Response. And now we are looking into Beyond the Relaxation Response today. So I will start, here's what we're going to do today. Maybe I should have said that straight off in the beginning, but here's what we're going to do. I'm saying it now. Okay, so I'm going to give some ground information around what is it that he's discovering, what is his primary message, and going a little bit into the astrology at the time for that even to be possible to have been found. And then we're going to go through the book Beyond the Relaxation Response. And um, and just if you haven't been with me before, when I do these dives into a book or into an, an author, into a theme, all of it, um, it, I can quote as much as I want, okay? This is the rules. <laughs> so sometimes what I'm saying is going to be a, a direct quote from the book. Other times I'm going to say my thoughts about it. But every time... I explicitly say my thoughts about it. I say, hey, this is me, Mana. So the rest, you can re- be assured that it's from the book. It's mostly not direct quotes, maybe a few, some of the words. Uh, many of the words are the same, but I'm kind of paraphrasing to shorten it and to take out what I found is essential. So it is my reading of it. I just feel like saying that to any new listener, so so you don't read the book and you're like that's the exact same words that you were saying isn't that some kind of copyright or whatever um so it's it's not because that's that's what i'm doing here what i should probably do is declare that it's got that's going to be a you know a spoiler alert (laughs) is what you'd say i'm definitely going to spoil this book if if you want to read it so but no I think definitely you should read it because there's many details that I'm not going into but I'm not going to leave any surprises out is just what I meant okay okay how are you doing I I need to check in I get because I get excited this is the heart energy fire energy in me and it's all great right but it can anything can be too much so I just need to take that a little bit down into my center, into below my navel, ah, and relax. And that reminds me actually of one thing is I want to do a meditation off of this. Um, but I'm going to do it separately. So I'll put that in a separate uh, file for you so you can just do the meditation. Because this is... This is sort of what's required, some kind of meditation when you want to let go of tension and when you want to let go of what has been survival strategies, right? Because uh, now I mentioned my father, but it certainly didn't start with him. It certainly didn't start with him. And and because uh, from one perspective, from one way of working with it, there's, there's the anger and there's the emotional 
piece of healing, right? But then just from looking at it from a little bit more of a distance when I'm talking about it here, I see that, you know, he was just a, a baby who didn't have his needs met at all. And okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say this little side note, right? And it's not a commercial, it's not ever gonna be commercials in this podcast. When I'm at my complete lowest, and I see no other way than putting in commercials, this podcast is gonna stop, because I'm not doing that. I feel so many podcasts that I used to listen to is now just coming up with these annoying brainwashing elements and I've stopped listening to them. So I'll do audiobooks instead because then, yeah, you pay for it. But then, I mean, yeah, you pay for not to, to not be so disturbed. Anyway, <laughs> it's not a commercial, but, uh, but I'm mentioning something that can be bought and I'm not recommending it because I just did it the other day and I don't know if it's any good but it's this thing you've probably seen called my heritage and I think there are many models or many apps many I, I think if you just google my heritage a lot of different uh, offer services are gonna come up so but this one was an app and I you know there's this free part where okay I started entering a little bit about because I don't know this is you know, this is my, this is a story, this is a narrative that I'm born with. I don't know my family. Um, I know, of course, of the people that I grew up with, but then I think people just had kids old and then they died and they didn't talk about the past, even when I asked and I asked and I asked. Whereas if if someone is going to ask me one day, oh, I'll give you the juicy details. I'll give you the juicy details. <laughs> I will not have any photos to show for it probably because it's all because I've moved so many times. So I just don't have any tangible things with me. But I'll I'll keep the juicy stories if any after me is, is going to want to know. Anyway, so that is what is appealing to me about something like my, my heritage is, okay, could I connect with someone who knew someone that I was biologically related to. Why? I've asked myself that, especially when the price came up because there's a free part and then all of a sudden you have to pay and you don't have to pay a little. It's like a lot all at once. So I was like, uh, kind of postponed it a few days and and then I, I bought it because I was like, I this is this is too tempting it's like I really would want to know and again why uh, not just for curiosity but but for the curiosity of okay could there be someone in my biological lineage that actually succeeded I've not seen it anywhere I've not I'm sorry to speak like this but I've not seen it people are struggling big time in in my lineage, it's, it's what I've seen. It's it's the nerves, it's the abuse, it's the lies, it's the be, being pulled so deeply into religion that you cannot see anything else than that. It's the, a lot of health, a lot of health problems, a lot of physical symptoms, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And no one, I've seen no one stand up and say, hey, this physical problem, maybe there's emotion, there's emotional component to it. Nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> so I'm, lo I'm looking for something to be, I think, proud of. And also, if they could do it, then maybe I can do it, sort of thing. And yeah, so did I find anything yet? No, <laughs> I, but I almost did. So I kind of felt the excitement of almost finding something because I found someone who a lot of people had put him in. So this is, I'm not going to play really <laughs> knowledgeable about this, about how it works. But how I think it works is that I put some things in that I know and then someone else puts their stuff in that they know and then that different matches between different of these uh, trees that you make in there. Uh, 
so anyway, there was this one person that many people had put it in put in information about and photos about, but the same photo. <laughs> I guess you just had one shot back then. <laughs> it's like the same photo a lot of people had put in. I was like, oh my God, I'm related to this. And I felt my life changing right there, right? I was like, oh God, it's finally happening. Uh, because he was something like a judge. I don't think it was exactly a judge, but I think it was he was working within law, in the legal system. And he had like six children or something who then also spread their genes all over. So... And he had he had a famous address in, in in a famous address inside of Copenhagen that's really expensive. So I was like, oh, it's it's in me. Maybe maybe I can actually become someone. And then and then I realized he was just married to someone who was in. I'm not saying that's bad. It's great to be married to someone, right? But uh, I'm I'm just saying we are not biologically related. We are not biologically related. So that was a bit of a bummer right there. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, the real self, right? I think you don't have to rely on what other people in your past did. I think you can actually... You can. This is this is actually what it's all about. It is about transformation. This is what I think this this book is about. It's a concrete technique to how to transform all of those intergenerational tension patterns. Is is what I call it in your own body, in your own psyche, so that you know new things can happen. Anyway, I completely forgot why I started talking about that. So. <laughs> let's let's get going. Let's get going. He was Herbert Benson, Dr. Benson, American doctor, and he was born on April 24, which means he's a Taurus in 1935. And like I said, he died last year, uh, February 3rd, 2022. Um, so we're gonna. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the astrology but first he discovered what he called the relaxation response okay the relaxation response is a counter to the flight and fight response and that's pretty important to know because it's very well known the f fight or flight right uh, response so that the opposite of that would be relaxation and he would use meditation visualization as the gateway to healthful inner physiologic and genetic changes and also to break free into a new life where you are maximizing your inherent capabilities. How? 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 <laughs> well, by utilizing more fully the activities of the right hemisphere of the brain or the sense of well intuition but but even you know that kind of light bulb moment where your mind is illuminated those experiences are more real than what can be reduced to words he said so herbert demonstrated the power of the human mind over disease back in the 70s however like he said it is not new it is not new. It is from the Eastern tradition. There has been a split off in Western culture. and But yeah, he dedicated his life to a scientific investigation of the Eastern claims, especially Tibetan Buddhism. And these Buddhist monks who reported ability to raise their skin temperatures dramatically in cold environments through meditation. Uh, and this is the fierce woman meditation. We're going to get to that when we go through the book. But it, it created a, an internal fire of purification in the human body that counteracts falsehood and encourages a higher state of consciousness. So the prana created the heat. And we've talked about that before in this podcast as uh, bioelectricity. And, and Herbert Benson described how what 
happen for these monks? It is the relaxation response. Because that is that is really the mechanism that is at work. And one of his, his goals is to make a mental revolution where we must overthrow the hegemony of the left hemisphere and allow the right hemisphere to break free and assume its full stature in the thinking process. In this way, we can hope to open the door to beneficial change and growth in our lives. And he's, he said in, a, in an interview, because I kind of read, this is from bits and pieces from different places, what I'm saying now. And I, I read an, an interview with him. Um, I think it's one of those interviews where you don't think it's going to be transcribed and read after he's dead. But but I liked it. I, th- those are the best. <laughs> uh, anyway, one of his quotes in that interview, he, he said, you see the world differently. You see the world, it opens your mind in such a way that prepares you to see there are other interpretations of the same event. Okay, so that was my little introduction to Herbert Benson, but let's go deeper into it. Uh, the, the book that we're looking into today, and it's really just because I was drawn to, rather than reading the relaxation response. I wanted to read the beyond the relax- relaxation response. That's just how I work. I, w- I want to go beyond straight away. So that is the book that I've chosen. It was published in 1984, which is really exciting for several reasons. Okay, so it, it's really exciting with 84 for different reasons. So we have what we call ingress years for a, a an outer planet, and so the English years for Pluto in Scorpio, which is something that I want to talk a lot about because I feel that this podcast is all about Pluto in Scorpio, um, and and so it it dipped in there in eighty three Pluto in Scorpio, and it was there t- twice again in eighty four, and then you know then it happened, then it stayed for a number of years. Not very many compared to, but you can listen to that about in the, uh, I don't remember the chapter, what is it called? Something about Pluto generations, perhaps? I would probably have called it something like that. So the ingress years, right, right now, for example, right, 2023, we are in the ingress years of Pluto in Aquarius. It's going to continue all, all through next year, and then it's going to stay for many years. So I wonder... What revelations can happen now within psychology? We're talking about Pluto. How will psychology be reformed if we're thinking about that piece of Aquarius? Okay, what what you hear now, even when you just heard me say bits and pieces about Herbert Benson and his discoveries, you may be like, okay, I'm not impressed. <laughs> I, I'm just not impressed. It's like normal. Yes, that is what it's like when someone is something is being discovered and and taken up. And and as he said, it's not new, but it's what is new about it is the integration into the Western mind. Okay, so what is Pluto and Scorpio about because th- this is the time where it was possible for him to do what he did. 1984, the year of the movie Terminator. I just it's just even like the name in in the Scorpio yeah, archetype, terminating. Uh, and then we have George Orwell's dystopian novel about uh, named 1984. But it's also a year of some great inventions where it's the first time where you can do this thing where you fertilize an egg and transfer that to another woman. So you can have you can have birth, you can have new life. That's also Scorpio. Pluto and Scorpio, it's about destroying, destroying and reconstructing. About being able to see the limitations. And then find the key that opens the door to liberation to go outside of those limitations. It's not death in a literal sense, but it's coming to an end. Feel the need to now master your emotional being. So you're not 
for example, overpowered by your own desires, but that you can be smart with your body. And the essential thing here is really consciousness about what is going on at an energetic level. It's not logic. It's just not logic. And the reason why consciousness in in this way is so important is that for us not to be possessed by parasites. There's something about destroying, just letting it sink into total termination what cannot stand anymore and then reconstructing it in a way where you are much more uh, protected. So another reason why this is super curious, super funny and exciting is that he, Herbert Benson, was himself a Taurus. So go on beyond relaxation. I mean, Pluto in Scorpio, is that it? Yeah, I mean, it's al- the alchemy of it and the alchemy of the psyche and, and for that to have opposed his son, that's a big deal. But I see the word beyond actually may relate more to Uranus that went into Sagittarius in 1981. And so it was there also in 1984. It was, I think, in the middle of the sign, 12 degrees. So Sagittarius is about the interrelations of life. Can you hear it? Can you hear how it's related to what we're talking about? The interrelate. Otherwise, just if you could just remember everything that I'm saying now as we go through the book, it's, it may get more entertaining like that. Okay, the interrelations of life. It's about expansion. It's about intuition and seeking potential, seeking what could be. And the aim in Sagittarius is, of course, then to make it tangible. But it's also about faith. And belief systems is is something we'll speak about today. Now with Uranus in that sign, Uranus brings that visionary quality in the context of belief. So it's developing, it's even revolutionizing the common belief system. And one thing more that's really important, I think, related to what we're going to hear today is the objectivity of Uranus, so the objective truth. Um, it's, uh, or maybe it's it's better to say the sign, the science that Uranus is bringing the science and then connecting it to the belief in Sagittarius. So I really feel that that is quite accurate in terms of what he is in fact doing here. Now his his first and very popular book. Relaxation Response was published in 1975, where Uranus instead was in Scorpio, meaning that that has opposed his son in Taurus. So getting this radical Uranus approach to body Taurus and psyche Scorpio out in the open, just to, this is just some keywords um, you can play around with, but of course it has a lot of, it's of course has a, a deeper meaning and it's a big thing for Pluto to oppose your son for sure but then it's yeah it's also in the sign its own sign of Scorpio that's it is big let's go to the book right let's go to the book okay ah let's do a (laughs) check-in Amanda how are you doing I'm getting so excited about this so I'm speaking fast and um lifting myself more up okay so let's go down let's bring the energy down so so that I get to be a part of this without tensing up. Okay, the first chapter is an introduction to the power of the faith factor, FF, the faith factor. I think he likes to do th- something with words like that because relaxation response also are two R's. And now he's bringing in the faith factor. Okay, he starts out by saying that when there was this desert film, Lawrence of Arabia, when that was shown in the movies, in movies there was air condition and it was kind of a cool climate, the audience still started to feel an overwhelming sense of thirst. So these people 
in the movies were not deprived of water, but they still felt that way. They identified with those waterless conditions that they saw on the screen. And they identified with it so thoroughly that their body became convinced that they were on the Arabian dunes. And his point here by starting out by this scenario is that influential and life-changing forces are often not externally real. So it's about how we interpret reality or how our body sees the concrete world around us that is important. Our personal powers and potential for well-being are shaped by the negative or positive ways we think. The principle of the importance of a personal belief has been one of Herbert's focal points during research for his famous book, The Relaxation Response, and also the book on the, the mind-body effect, published in 79. His research has shown additional possibilities for the relaxation response, which is why he now wants to write this book. So what is the relaxation response? It is, he defines it as this, inborn capacity for the body to enter a special state characterized by lowered heart rate, decreased rate of breathing, lowered mood pressure, lower brain waves, and an overall reduction in the speed of metabolism. So you experience peace and a person's pattern change to break free of worry cycles, these unproductive grooves of circuits, health-impairing thoughts, he calls it, health-impairing thoughts. So the technique, relaxation response, he's using is to find a quiet environment, consciously relax the body muscles, Focus for 10 to 20 minutes on a mantra and assume a passive attitude toward intrusive thoughts. He's, he's going through it a little bit more in depth uh, later in the book. So I will too. But now he says in Beyond, this Beyond book, that he at first thought that this was all that was required to elicit benefits from the relaxation response. Just do this. And yeah, it does reduce stress. But Herbert has now, in 1984, come to understand that this technique, combined with a person's belief system, the faith factor, can create internal environments that can help a person reach enhanced states of health and well-being. Now, really remember, please remember his scientific background. This is the whole reason why this is huge. Otherwise, it just sounds like something a lot of people would say, especially now and not so much then. But I'm sure some people from the New Age environment could say this, right? This is me, Mana, speaking, by the way. <laughs> I promise to make that distinction. <laughs> this is me, Mana, speaking. Okay, so it's it's just important to, to remember that Herbert Benson is a doctor. In, yeah, a medical doctor. I mean, there's different doctors, right? He has a scientific background. And so what he is concerned with is to scientifically observe phenomena and forces that accompany faith. Any faith, this is Uranus, any faith. Okay, so in Sagittarius, this is me, man, again. In Sagittarius, we can be really uh, just trust this one thing and this is the only truth but you know it's really colored by Uranus there who's opening up and saying it's it's not it's not about that this is a, this is a lot more objective than that it's about any faith through the faith factor one can relieve headaches backaches overcome insomnia alleviate uh, symptoms of anxiety including nausea and diarrhea short temper and the inability to get along with others and the list goes on. But he says, it's not like you can achieve perfect health or become a superhuman. Uh, he, he does suggest to use it in conjunction with modern medicine. So he is a medical doctor, right? To use it together with something else. So in addition to uh, 
the medical profession he advises to, to that you use this for optimal results. Having said that, he underscores that most of us have little idea how great our individual potential is, both physically and mentally. So when you truly believe in your personal philosophy or religious faith, if you are committed, mind and soul, to your worldview, you may very well be capable of achieving remarkable feats of mind and body that many only speculate about, he says. So what's the science? Herbert says that Einstein's theory of relativity and the unified concepts of physics change what people thought was real and comprehensible. Scientific developments are also affecting our approach to the workings and capabilities of the mind. Because what is reality to our bodies? Is it what I see, hear, touch, smell? Or are there other realities that our senses cannot detect? Can our minds be altered by our belief of what is real? Okay, just to remind you. I, man, eh? <laughs> have spent most my life inside the mind prison of fundamentalistic views. Religion, right? So this sort of reading, it's actually hitting me hard as I go through it. Because, yeah, I know exactly how powerful beliefs are. And Herbert mentions how because of a dream, you can also have a physical reaction. Because during dreaming, our minds believe that what we are dreaming is actually happening and our bodies respond accordingly. So as you run in your sleep and you experience that physical effort of running in your body when you wake up. So you've, you've not run anywhere. It's just this is what you imagined in sleeping and now the body is feeling it. So Herbert says that reality for our organs is what is what the mind perceives as reality. What's reality for our, our organs is what our mind, you know, if our mind perceives as, as reality, then they send this message, a physical message to our organs saying this is reality. And when we learn something new, uh, additional wiring is put into place in the brain. Um, you know, it can be said that there are different influences to the creations of, of new pathway uh, in the brain. It can be genetic makeup. It can be the, the stage of development of our nervous system, the environment, our health. But the point is that our brains can create new circuits or wirings that contain new information. So, but what he's talking about, he says it's not exactly brain wiring. It's true that electrical impulses play an important role in thinking processes, but the but that is also the chemicals is is doing that. So, but it's a helpful image as I read him. I I, I think that's what he's saying that it's an, a helpful image to think about new wiring, as we're trying to understand the potentials of the mind. So the mental wires help make up the network of what we now know as our memories, which also can intrude in disturbing uninvited ways. The body may have learned something as a result of past experiences. It could be to associate a smell from a certain food with an illness, so you don't eat that food again. It's, it's not actually the intake of the food because you've not eaten the food this time. You've just smelled it. And the smell is enough for you to not eat that food because it, you're almost feeling oh, nauseous from it, for example. He says this is the placebo effect, right? So he later in the book, he defines the placebo effect. I'll just give you that now. It is any therapeutic procedure, a substance that lacks the specific power to help a condition being treated. That is the placebo effect. Okay, so it's a therapeutic procedure, a substance, but it doesn't in and of itself, it doesn't have the specific power to help this sickness go away. So placebo can be used if you get, for example, if you get a drug for tension and nervousness from the doctor, from the medical doctor, and you discover that the symptoms actually go away 
as soon as you think about the drug, because it's right there in your pocket. <laughs> so you could take it, and you maybe you consider to take it, but then it, it goes away. And that means that the knowledge is often enough to active circuits in the brain that results in the relief that the pill would have given. Now, Herbert says that we know that any treatment is more likely to be successful if the patient has a great deal of faith in the physician's ability or in a faith in a higher power that is at work in, in the body. could be that. The mind influence over your body in these powerful subconscious ways that can again be positive as negative. And now he asks if the action of our minds, can it then also affect things outside of our bodies? Can our minds somehow create or participate in creating rippling disturbances in the universe that can alter not only our own bodies, but also the physical surroundings outside our bodies? And Herbert refers to theoretical physicists who are exploring unified theories of matter and energy and suspect that there is a single force that underlies all the physical reality in the universe. And we can talk about it in complex mathematical formulas, this relationship between particle and wave. We can talk about that in complex mathematical formulas, this relationship between particle and waves that, that can't be described in ordinary thought processes. But particle and waves are interdependent and constantly react with one another. Or, 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 or a unified theory of the universe can be talked about in Buddhist terms. In Buddhism, they talk about the forces or the profound connection that binds together all things. And when you meditate or you pray, you tap into that basic force. And Buddhists believe, he says, that we can become imbued with powers far beyond the scope of normal human achievements in entering this fundamental energy field. This is used in other theories of incarnation and resurrection that modern biology has not yet been able to formulate open-ended, unified concepts and terminology for that suggest subatomic ties with other sciences. This is, this is a little beyond my scope, man. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sense of what I read. <laughs> okay, it's essential to understand that a different kind of structure than of uh, space-time is required if we are to think out the interrelatedness of things in the cosmos, how Uranus and Sagittarius is this. If we are to think out the interrelatedness of things in the cosmos. So divine revelation of breakthroughs from the higher reality, higher than our own, must determine what we can know of God or can know of the supernatural realm. And when you succeed in transcending ordinary logical thought and perceiving directly the inexpressible nature of undifferentiated reality, you see that separate parts are not really separate. So according to mystics from around the world, each moment of enlightenment reveals everything. All the separate parts of the universe are manifestations of the same whole. There is only one reality, whole, unified. And so the phenomena of enlightenment and the science of physics have much in common. So what does it mean for the way our minds may affect our bodies and environment? Well, if the universe is interconnected, we may be able to learn how to use our minds to understand and perhaps influence the outside reality. Herbert says that he in earlier books described the relaxation response as a bodily reaction brought on by relaxational meditative techniques that anyone can employ to strip away destructive inner stresses. It can be scientifically measured in the body by metabolism and heart and respiration rates. 
that decrease so that you have this calming effect in your body. Now, Herbert has learned something since then. This is the beyond. He's learned something since then, and that is this combination with deep personal faith. He refers again to, no, I, I think this is the first time in the book, I just mentioned it earlier, right? But he refers to, to Tibetan Buddhists who have been reported to be able to stay alive in midwinter without clothes by employing a form of meditation, this fierce woman meditation, that was rooted in a profound religious faith. So the conscious mind can play a much greater role in controlling the body's physical processes than many Western scientists had previously thought before this research. This is what part two of this book is about, his adventures in the Himalayas. Now, the, the monks who practiced this form of meditation, they couldn't care less about the peripheral practical results of their spiritual activities. For them, the heat they emanate is the byproduct of a sacred religious rite that is supposed to burn false perceptions of reality out of their physical being. So for our purposes in the Western mind here, the significance of meditation lies in somewhat of a different direction than that. And that is the medical uses of the technique. It can be a practical way to help people with impaired circulation. Also, in general, how a Tibetan doctor works was inspiring as they get personally involved in examining intimate things like the patient's urine specimen, uh, check the color, smell, uh, check the clarity. So by being intimately involved, the Tibetan doctor actually communicated to the patients that he cared about them as individuals rather than just placing some antiseptic laboratory procedure. And this is me, Mana, meddling <laughs> again. I just have a comment to that because I actually had a teaching the other day online. And I totally felt, at least before, I think it was pretty good when I was there actually, but even, but just before during the emails, I really felt like just yet another number, just like, this is how we do it. This is what is going to happen. This is, you know, this is n like nothing personal. And it was not a teaching about healing. <laughs> so uh, it, it doesn't matter in, in that. But I just, I want you to think about when you think about this, because he's, we're going to get more into how this effect of the relationship to the physician, um, how that influences your health. So if you can think of a situation where you had that experience, but that, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, it's going to be the same with anyone. Yeah, we have a one-on-one, and on, one and one, but actually it's not, you know, it's not going to be up to you what happens or something like that. Uh, so I just, I, I could just immediately relate that as I read it. Okay, now uh, Herbert is very clear that there are, limits to the curative powers of the Tibetan approach. So he's not being naive here because the Tibetan doctors are behind with antibiotics and with surgery. Uh, but strangely enough, he says, against the expectations of our present medical knowledge, some of those Tibetan remedies seem to do the job in bringing about medical improvements. The only valid healing ingredient that can be identified in these cures is the presence of strong belief, both belief, strong belief in the patient, strong belief in the doctor, they believed in the treatment. And then this factor of establishing a positive, trusting relationship with one another. So all of that can alter the patient's physiology and affect the cure or relief of bodily diseases, changes that can be measured scientifically. And Herbert's adventure in the Himalayas, of course, helped to define in more precise terms the power of the mind over the body. Also, a key role in generating positive or negative responses in our bodies is that outside object, like a doctor, what that doctor is doing, how he's relating to the patients. 
Okay, part three of this book. It's more of a practical guide. Uh, Herbert again describes a relaxation response, uh, but in more detail. So I'm going to go through that. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I plan to do a meditation afterwards where we can try not the exact th- thing out because I'm going to magnetize it. <laughs> I'm going to make it mine. <laughs> but we're going to use some of it because because I've used it. And it's really good. Okay. So what he says is that is that you sit comfortably, you close your eyes, and you relax your muscles. You focus on your breathing, and you breathe slowly and naturally. And then you select a word or a phrase, then repeat it, or see it in your mind's eye each time you exhale. And when outside thoughts intrude during meditation, disregard them by saying, oh well, and return to the word or the prayer or the mantra you selected. And Herbert makes a, a clear point of maintaining that passive relaxed style in dealing with any interruptions. The relaxation response break up the inappropriate loops of thinking formed in the wiring of your brain. The Tibetan monks believed that meditation put them in tune with the universe's beneficial energies that could heal. Traditional Chinese medicine called it qi, the Indians called it prana, the Hawaiians used the term, are you ready for it? Mana, it's mana, isn't it great? It, it's not spelled completely the same as my name, but I don't care about that, I'm totally taking that on. Uh, this is the three that he mentions, but I know that there are actually many more cultures who have that same uh, thing that they can identify and say, you know, yeah, Chi, prana, mana, uh, but there are other words out there. I just don't know them right now. And it doesn't matter because it's not in the book. So what he says, Herbert, is that many reasons in different cultures are given for the power of meditation. But they all elicit what we today call the relaxation response. And then Herbert goes into how to combine the relaxation response with your personal beliefs. Okay, and this is actually what I I kind of started out by saying earlier, but then I chose to silence myself. I'm going to say it right now. Okay, I study Taoism and in particular Qigong, and I love it and I'm serious about it and I'm passionate about it uh, because it really resonates with me. But because of my past, um, I'm not entirely confident in in all of the beliefs to it and this is where i'm challenged because when he speaks about the faith factor i feel very skeptical towards anything now after leaving a religion i feel skeptical without wanting it it's like i'm not i'm not willing (laughs) to be skeptical i'm willing to open my heart to all of these amazing practices and uh, philosophies but something is it's really challenging for me to do around that. Now, you know how I care about self-examination and it is really an area and this book has also been an occasion to to really examine myself here because, okay, saying I've been in religion for so many years, I found out I couldn't trust it and I had this breakdown of I can't trust anything and now it would make sense for me to yeah i've gone through a spiritual awakening but i still have difficulties trusting anything it sort of sort of makes could make some sense right i've also been into kundalini yoga for a long time not a long time but in my timeline it was quite a long time to stick to anything and then that whole thing happened with the leadership and i just yeah stopped doing that even though it, it also resonated and of course I could feel the effect. I think it's hard not to feel the effect of that kind of breathing. Um, but but yeah, okay, what do I want to say about this? I, I think I want to say that I understand if anyone out there could have similar um, resistance to believing believe in anything, but... Okay, self-examination has also led me to this conclusion, uh, open conclusion. Okay, 
Okay, I'm saying that I'm skeptical because I used to be religious. Okay, well, actually, the skepticism is derives from the religion. When I think about it, it's like when I was in the religion, I would be completely closed off to anything outside of what was exactly in the Bible. Okay, and if someone were to say that something was in the Bible that the community didn't believe, well, then we would just find some other Bible verses to throw at that. So it was very narrow-minded. And it's the, actually the narrow mind that, I'm, that I can be struggling with in terms of wanting to open up. The narrow mind and, and the, the rationality, exactly what he's saying here, that you know, opening up more for the, the right hemisphere. So yeah, it's just so interesting to see Okay, I thought it was my religious trauma, <laughs> but actually, but in a way it is, because what part of it is the trauma? Is it, is it the stuck pieces that's still inside of you from having had that belief, or is it that the consequences of leaving it? I'm not sure. Um, but so that realization, and I'm pretty sure I've had it before, I just often forget it. Um, made me okay think there is something that I believe in I certainly believe that tension in my body is supposed to work as a wake up call so great <laughs> there's something I can trust there the, the tension okay and that's exactly what relaxation response is Is that is a tool to counter that tension and the ills that comes from that tension and so the book is about exercising it in the context of a personal belief system, which is why I made this little stop to explain about myself and my process. Um, because when you do it in, in the context of your personal belief system, the inner capacity to combat tension is enhanced and to treat a physical problem and also increasing mental powers. You know, well, There's a lot of things he's talking about here that can really be accelerated. So I just concluded, openly concluded, <laughs> that I believe in relaxation. It's very meta, right? But uh, when choosing a, a personal word, for example, because you're going to do that if you do the meditation with me, you need to, to choose an important word, phrase for you, something that you believe in. And this is where it can get challenging when you have religious trauma. Because what, <laughs> what can I truly believe in, right? But I found out, well... I believe in relaxation. This is an epiphany that I've had and it's so valuable to me. And it is, I'm feeling it constantly that, uh, that this is the tension I need to counter that from being programmed into by culture, by my own unique environment, but also by the collective values that I've taken on into my own nervous system and into my own body. So my phrase will be something like release. Uh, relax or uh, he actually has a good suggestion he has different suggestions and one I like is the peace that passes understanding so to say a phrase like that okay going back into the book now um so a phrase like that has a, a dual function it can activate belief which provide greater calming effect on your mind than with a natural word and it increases the likelihood of your use of the technique. Isn't that true? I read like, that's right. You know, <laughs> if I believe it, I'm going to do it. If, it. if I struggle against some resistance in me, I'm you know, probably not going to do it as much. So if I believe it, I'm actually going to do it. So I think that's a genius stroke. Herbert has another fine, really fine point here. He says that it's a mistake to try to direct the faith factor to operate in a certain way on a disease or a disability because this active use of the will activates the sympathetic nervous system and in turn may cause or aggravate the problem rather than improve it. In other words, the passive attitude that is associated with the faith factor will allow the problem to subside only when you stop trying so hard i'm like clapping my hands because i feel this is often what i do this is me man again this is often what i do with something i'm like yes 
have to manifest. And then I'm all tense thinking about the things that I want to manifest because it's so important for me. It's such an overwhelming desire. And Herbert says, back off. Back off with the desire to get well. It could even be that you want to want find healing from something. Uh, as you practice the elements that make possible the benefits of the faith factor, it's important to move from active desire to passive acceptance. And there is a fine line there between the health desire to get well and then the stressful anxiety that can overtake the desire for health. I feel that that is something I spoke to Wiggy Werner about in this podcast if you wanted to check out that interview. Like you have this strong longing, but yet can that then be turned into something very stressful and an anxiety instead? Okay, so some more studies here. Herbert started then to divide these faith healing practices into three categories. One, self-willed healings. Two, healings that are dependent upon the presence of a healer. Three, healings that occur without the person who is being healed is willing and without the presence of a healing. And this could also occur in plants and animals. Okay, so the first two the self-willed healing and those that can involve the actual presence of a healer can be understood in part in terms of the placebo effect that we've been speaking about. This is the, the reference to the changes produced by beliefs and expectations and interpersonal relationships. Now, healers also make use of the relaxation response. The healer enters an altered state of consciousness. And Herbert brings in the spiritual healer Harry Edwards and quotes him uh, because he says that for healing power to begin to operate, he found that he must avoid the temptation to concentrate. The quote is, it is not a mental concentration that is needed, but mental abandonment. The ideal to be arrived at is a stage of mental meditation with the directive of seeking contact with a spirit. That's the quote. So Herbert says that the purpose of eliciting relaxation response is to reach attunement with the person being healed. So the healing powers, forces, energies will pass through the subject. I, and I hope you heard about this in Mimena. I, I hope you heard the chapter on Masterson because this is really also going on in talk therapy where you must be so aware of your own internal state in order to show up for the client. It's quite the same as Herbert says here about that there's no attempt to do anything, but simply meet the person. As a healer, there's then also this uniting of the energy with the client or with the subject, whereas we don't do that in, th in therapy. Okay, but the third kind of healing, the type that occurs without the subject, uh, the the person is is willing and without the healer even being present. So this presents greater difficulty, he says. The healer has to work from afar and the belief of the subject is not a factor at all. And in it can, like I said, also be found in f plants and animals. So what they are concerned, they don't know that a healing is expected. There's no room for any placebo here. So he says that controlled experiments involved uh, plants and animals and they have performed, I think he concludes, not so well in scientific studies. But Herbert says that such experiments should not be repeated without other healers. So I think there's like a critique of a certain study here. Open-minded investigations might reveal exciting and useful information about these reported mind-body possibilities and the scientific basis for faith healing. And these studies could also help us understand where scientific inquiry must end and where the exploration of some sort of spiritual reality should begin. Because it, he is curious about the scientific basis for reported miracles in holy places and also the medical implications of healings of sick from Protestant groups. You know, that can be all of these miracle events. Um, 
not in that conservative environment I grew up in. That was simply just forbidden and called superstition. But when I was a young adult, I did go to those kind of miracle events. And whenever I felt, oh, I wonder if this is true, like the, my religion, then I would think of what I had seen in those places and I would get reassured, oh, okay, it is true because that person actually got healed. Herbert's quest is really a search for the link between the power of belief and its practical effect on physical reality. And he wants us to speculate about the extraordinary, to explore the unlikely and hope for what is now believed to be impossible. Isn't that great? Oh, man. You're through the book. It wasn't a, a, such a long book, like 140 pages or something. So I appreciate that. And still I feel we got really into some some deep, important questions here. Okay, just looking through my notes to see what I forgot. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just comment shortly that the reason why Uranus and Pluto are particularly important for this well for this these discoveries and for him to be able to publish this is because that these are very personal planets to Herbert Benson Dr. Herbert Benson uh, the sun is conjunct Uranus and he has Pluto on his uh, south node I think it's almost exactly as two degrees from the south node uh, so it's it's very it's very important for him with these planetary characters in the first place. And that's how it's one of the things that we look at in astrology is where is the planet in the natal chart. And then we can expect that it's going to have the more impact on the person when something with that planet is uh, happening, like when it's changing signs, what, which is what I was talking about in the beginning there. Of course, also noting that Uranus in Sagittarius, that I've I felt that we've really talked about maybe the whole time here, uh, that it is also opposing then his uh, Gemini planets, which is also important again, because it's making it even more personal to him. Okay, and then, yeah, I know I just had a joke about when I said higher powers, I wanted to sing Coldplay, higher powers. I missed that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Then I had a final note uh, for today. And I feel like I'm like the angry classroom teacher. And I really don't mean to be. But okay. It's just, I don't, I don't know. Who's going to hear this anyway? But when I have guests on here uh, and you want to uh, direct a critique, on the podcast <laughs> send it to me please send it to me because i've had a couple of now who said something to me oh this person texted me about this and that issues that didn't have to do with their content but more with the technical side of my podcast please please let it all go to me i know this is probably not gonna target the people who who said that in the first place but yeah i just need a somewhere to say that also because then there have been some ideas to the guests like listeners have sent ideas to the guests for the podcast and that's not their business if you will i mean well business literally business because i do have a sound guy that i pay to optimize the sound and i also pay for storage um for for these episodes uh, so that's maybe the business part of it uh, but also just it's my time. So if a guest is like, that's a good idea. You should really make this into 20 stories and then get it out there. And the guest is really excited about that. I'm now <laughs> the person who has to say, you know, I'm sorry about that. You should just be a guest on another podcast because that's not happening. And so I'd rather that you send the, those ideas to me <laughs> so that a listener can, you, you know, that guest cannot say to me, oh, this came from a listener. Uh, you should do that. Um, because it's not happening, um, at least not while I don't have a whole team behind me and there's only this little fish who's trying to be aware of her own water. Okay, so I think this was what I have for now. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll join me on the meditation 
So I'll do the relaxation response technique, but in my way, in my version. I feel that's be- becoming a thing because I did it with the inner smile as well. So, but it's just because this book was so much about the technique. So, uh, why not? Like, s- this is audio and it's perfect for meditations. So, so I hope you'll you'll join me there. Until next time. <laughs>